What did we learn yesterday? We used CRUD, I want to say, to update, to make the messages work. I think yep. uh, where we send them in. And what does CRUD stand for? Create, update, delete. Create, read, update, delete. Yeah, I forgot that. <laughs> so those are our four main database operations, right? We need to create some data. That's our insert statement. We need to be able to read the data. That's our select statement. We worked on that edit message functionality for the first time. That's the update. And we learned a lot of steps involved in getting that edit to work, right? We need to know what message we're editing. We need to know um, what we're updating the message content to. We need to uh, add in the edit button. That edit button needs to pass in the ID of it. And then once that edit is done, on our front end, we also have to be able to update the state to show that updated message content. So a little bit more involved than you might think for getting our messages to edit to get our content to update. Um, but hopefully that gave you a good starting point for your homework, which I will get posted tonight uh, due over the weekend, which will be adding in the delete functionality. And you're going to have to do that both on the front end code and in the back end code. But hopefully the steps that I outlined uh, will help you get started on that to pull off all of the steps to make a message delete. Do we have any questions, anything else from yesterday that we learned, any light bulb moments, anything like that? Okay, then we are going to jump in tonight um, with the blog project all the way back from week 15, day two. Um, so in my, my code folder, I'm going to week 15. I'm headed over to day two. This is when we were working on our blog project. I'm going to open up the blog folder, and I'm going to go ahead and delete out the node modules. Once we delete the node modules, I'm going to create a zip of this. You do not have to do that. But in case anyone wants to start with my code instead of their own code for week 15, um, day two, they are welcome to use the zip file that I just posted into the live stream. OK, I'm going to copy this blog folder. I'm going to go over to my week 19. I'm going to make a new folder called day three, and then I'm going to go ahead and paste in my blog. Now, blog is fine, but oftentimes when we're working on a front end and a back end, it's hard to tell them apart. So I'm actually going to rename my blog, blog dash front end. I am then going to take this and drag it into my VS code. I'm going to snap this over on the left side. I'm going to right click open an integrated terminal and I'm going to do my NPM install. That's going to regenerate out my node modules for me. And then I'm going to do my NPM start. When that fires up, what we should see in the browser is our blog. We may have a couple posts in here. We can go to the post editor that's got our tag uh, title, tagline, and content. I can type something new in here and hit post, and that now shows up on my home screen. And if I click on read more, it takes me into that post. So I'm going to pause there. That's just getting the front end set up, give you guys a chance to catch up. Again, we went to our week 15, day two. Inside the blog here, I deleted out my node modules. I copied this folder. I created our new day three folder inside my week 19. I pasted in my blog folder. I renamed it to blog front end. I opened it in VS Code. I right clicked on package.json and opened an integrated terminal. And then down in the terminal, I ran npm space install enter and then uh, npm start enter. npm space start enter.
anyone need help with those steps, I would highly, highly encourage everyone to follow along tonight because this is the kind of penultimate full stack project. This is the project that when you're working on your capstone and you need to go back and reference some code, you're going to want to go back and reference this code tonight. So I am highly encouraging everyone follow along tonight, even if you haven't been following along on previous projects, because it's going to be super, super important um, to be able to reference this when you're going back and working on your capstone. There are things that you might not need, um, but there are certainly things like the database that you will need some level of. And this is the project to practice on in class. Um, sometimes when you're following along with just taking notes, you don't know that you have questions about it, right? And so when you're coding along and following along, those questions naturally pop up. That's what we want to encourage. We're getting near the finish line here, right? So squeezing every last minute out of class we can to be beneficial for you guys. Okay, I think I've stalled long enough. Does anyone uh, need a minute to get their blog front end up and running? Okay. Um, I made it into my blog. Okay. Um, and you suggested we rename it front end? Blog dash front end. Yes. Can I do that in the, no, I can't do that right there. Okay. I'm close that. I don't think I'm too far behind. So I think okay. I'm. Thanks. So we're going to start a new backend project. And keep in mind that when we start a new backend project, it does not make the folder for us automatically like it does in Create React App. So in order to get started there, I'm going to right click and say new folder. And in that new folder, I'm going to do my blog dash backend. This is inside the day three folder inside week 19. Once I get that created, I'm going to head over to my terminal. And in my terminal, I'm going to do a CD space, grab, don't forget the space, you definitely need the space, grab my blog backend path and go ahead and drop that in. And I'm going to hit enter there. And I'm going to type in npm init space dash y. That is going to make our package.json for us. So we've got our blog front end folder from our week 15 day two. We made our new blog back end folder. We CD to that in the terminal. And then we uh, ran our npm init dash y. That's what created our package.json for us. Now, while we're here, we're going to need a couple packages. We're going to need npm install. And what do we need to install? Well, we build all of our APIs in the Express framework that runs on top of Node. So we're going to want Express. We know we're building an API that's going to be available on different ports. Um, so we're going to install cores. We know we're going to need our database, and our database that we use is PG. And then we've got one more new package, uh, actually two new packages coming your way. One is called SQLize, S-E-Q-U-E-L-I-Z-E. -E. That is our object relational mapper. We're going to learn how to use that uh, over the next week or so. And we're also going to learn how to use a program called bcrypt which is for password encrypting. I'm going to go ahead and post those uh, that command into the live stream, and I'll also put it in the Zoom chat. Uh, spelling is very, very important here. If you get an error that the package does not exist, chances are you spelled it wrong. 
So we're installing Express for our uh, Node framework. We're installing cores so that we don't have any security issues cross domain. We're installing PG for our Postgres database. We're installing SQLize, which we're gonna learn how to use over the next week. And Bcrypt is another new package that we're gonna learn how to encrypt our password. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit enter on that. And that's gonna kick off our install. Once we have that install done, I can close out of my terminal. I'm going to grab my blog backend, drag that into VS Code as well. And now we've got some setup we've got to do. I'm going to make a new file called server.js because we need a place to put all of our code. And then we need to start up our server. And in order to do that, we're going to go into package.json and do a start and say npx nodemon server.js. I'm sorry, Max, excuse me. We're, um, we started the front end. You opened the terminal there and did the- NPM install and NPM start, yes. Oh, that's an interesting. Something's really not right. Want to share your screen? Yes, please. Hmm. Um, so not really sure what happened here, but I you thought have a be... folder called blog front end inside another folder called blog front end. Shit. Okay. So in order to fix that, let's switch back over to your finder. And we're going to grab your blog front end. Oh, okay. Maybe it just opened weird. Let's try file, open folder, and we're going to grab your front end folder and open that here. Now we've got everything working the way we want, so we can open an integrated terminal, do our npm install, and our npm. Okay, great. Thank you. Yep. Uh -huh. And you're good to go. Sorry, Max. Um, is this a zip file or are we creating a new file? We Our front end is coming from week 15, day two. If you don't want to use your own code, you can use my zip file instead. The back end, we're starting completely from scratch. Okay, so day three and then... Okay. So your blog in your week 15, day two, copy mm -hmm. that. Um, paste it into week 19, day three, and rename it from blog to blog dash front end. Okay. Perfect. So up until this point, we should have our blog front end. We did our NPM install, and we can see in our browser the blog that we created last time. Then in the back end, we made a new folder called blog backend. We CD to that in our terminal and ran npm init dash y. That initialized the package.json for us so that we could run the install command that's in Slack. We installed express cores, pg, sqlize, and bcrypt. Sqlize and bcrypt are two new packages that we'll learn about over the next week or so. Then we went into our backend folder that we just created, opened that in VS Code, and we created a file called server.js. And we also in package.json added this comma at the end of the test and added in start npx node mon server.js. Pause there to poll, make sure everyone has a minute to get all their files set up. 
This is always the most number of steps. So I want to give everyone just a breather here. All right, Max. Um, do I have to install those other packages in my front end? No, just the back end. I have to install them all in the back end. Yes. So integrated npx start or npx install course npm install and the line that you're looking for is in the slack live stream yes brandon what's up um every time i'm trying to put in the uh npm init command it's telling me uh permission denied that's not good share your screen Um, that is because you haven't cd'd into the folder. So you need to type in cd space. Now um, grab your back end and drag it in and okay. hit enter. Oh. Now, now you're cd'd into the right spot. So okay, if you yep. do your npm init now. That's why. Yep. Okay. Now you're good to go. Jordan, what's up? Um, I do not have week 15, day two. Is that going to be posted? Was that posted back in um, the CIC student C4 or the live stream? That's in the live stream. It's called blog.zip. Okay. Okay. That one I did download. And then I don't, I, you whipped through that kind of quick. So I'm like still a little bit behind if you don't mind helping. Sure, share screen. Warden. I opened the blog front end in this one right here. How do I get the back end started? Give me remote. How do I do that? Should have popped up. Oh, it's over there on the other one. My bad. Okay. So we create a new file in your backend called server.js. Oh, come on. And then in a terminal, any terminal, we run the command npm init y. That's going to make your package.json file for you. It also is going to let us install things like express, cores, uh, EG, SQLize, and um, Bcrypt. And now that that's done, we can go back to the package.json and we need to modify your start command here to say npx node mon server.js. And then okay. in your front end, we just need to get that running. So we're going to open an integrated terminal. We're going to run our NPM install. And once that is done, we can do our NPM start, and then you will be all caught up. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Kali, what's up? I got the first step uh, from Jordan. So after you do the init, what do you do? NPM express or install? NPM it? install, that command is in Slack. Oh, sure. Thank you. Yeah. Exona, what's up? Can you hear me? Um, mm -hmm. It's saying that there's an error when I do, when I'm in the terminal trying to um, put in the back end. Share screen. Give me one second. um i did it wrong over here but then i redid it here and then it just gave me this error yeah that's just the slash that you have at the end of sqlize so if you hit the up arrow uh delete out everything going up to that last slash now hit enter and you're good to go. And so now I can just open it in 
VS Code, and you need to uh, make your server.js file and update it in package.json. Hold on, sorry. I'm going to start <laughs> live shares for you guys. Am I doing, no, you said node mod? I'm sorry, I was not paying attention. You're going to make a new file called server.js. Okay. And that's going to be blank for now. And then you're going to go into your package.json and modify the start command to use node mod. Oh, underneath the test? Yes. And that will look like this right here. Gotcha. X. So we're that yes. Okay, perfect. So any hey. oh Jennifer, go for it. You're on mute. Oops. Um are we supposed to open the terminal itself and do those other packages as well? All these packages were part of the initial install command. Oh, I'm not sharing my screen, sorry. Are you talking about all of these packages? Um, yes, bcrypt cores express. Those were all part of the install command. Oh, there it is, okay. So the only thing you need to modify in package.json is this start command right here. Okay. Yep, I'm good. Anyone else need help? This is the time to ask for it because if you don't have this set up right, everything else is going to go downhill. Hey, Max. Um... Yep. I don't see those in my package.json backend. Did you run the install command? Yes, NPM I did. Install. I did it in I did it in terminal and it said everything was installed. So I closed out of that and I went into the um back end and put it into our um I'm sorry, I'm a little off today. Um, it's fine. Share your it, screen. Let's take a quick look. I can't share my screen because I couldn't put both of my iPad and the computer together. So I'm on my iPad on thing. I do see, I, I put in my NPX no mom server. Yeah. But when I go into my package.json, it's not showing me like you had express and, and the. So what I would do it is just. It doesn't show me the dependencies. Pop open the open an integrated terminal and rerun your install command down here and see if that updates the package.json for you. Okay. The same one we did over there with SQLize and everything, right? You got it. Did that do it? Um, checking right now. I got him now. Beautiful. Good work. Patrick, I saw a hand raised and then lowered. Do you still need help? No, I'm caught up. Thank you. Cool. All right, last call. Anyone need help with project setup? OK, so now we get to go into server.js and get it all kicked off. So we need to, oh, no, I lied. There's one more thing I forgot. In our package.json, underneath the main, I forgot we need to do a type as module. That is what's going to allow us to use that. Uh, I'm not sharing my screen. 
we have to add this type module right here. That's what's going to let us use our newer import system instead of having to use the older require system. Um, this is called the module, the ES6 module syntax, import syntax, as opposed to the common JS require syntax. So make sure you've got your type module in here. Otherwise, Node is going to yell at us the second we start trying to import things. Okay, so once we've got our type module, don't forget the quotes on either side and the comma at the end. Because this is a JSON file, it is very, very picky about your quotes, even pickier than a, a typical JavaScript object would be. So make sure you've got your type module in there. Okay, now we get to the code. Now we get to set our server up. So um, I am going to go to server.js. And I'm going to say import express from express. And I'm also going to import cores from, you guessed it, cores. Now I need to make my server. So in order to make my server, I say uh, my server is equal to a new express instance. We basically say, hey, go fire up Express for me. Now I've got to tell my server, hey, cores is allowed. So I tell my server to use cores. Now I need to test and make sure my server is working. So I'm going to say server.get with an empty slash and all endpoints have a rec and a res. And all I'm going to do is send back res.send welcome to my blog API. Now we need one more thing to make this server complete. We need our server.listen. And we need to tell it what port to listen on. So we're going to do this on 3001 because our React blog already is taken up 3,000 on us. So I'm going to then put in this function that says console.log server running on port 3,001. And the reason I'm putting that in is if we see this, that means everything up here worked fine. But if we don't see this server running on 3001 at the bottom of our terminal, chances are we've got an error somewhere and we need to fix that. So I go down to my terminal. I do my NPM start. That fires up my node mod and says server running on port 3001. If I go to my browser and open up localhost 3001, I should have welcome to my blog API. If I do, you are all caught up and good to go. But because that was a lot of typing, I'm going to re-poll you guys, make sure you have enough time to get all of this typed out. Once you have all of this typed out, you can go to your terminal and run your npm start command and go open 3001 in your browser. Make sure that you've got that up and running. I have another dense question, Max. Yep. When we opened blog backend, we created a new folder, right? We created blog backend and then opened that folder in VS Code. And it was an empty folder. Correct. Then okay. we ran npm init dash y inside that folder and it made package.json for us. I was in the wrong. <laughs> I don't, I don't think it liked me. Um, I do have a link that I will share with you guys. This is um, a little bit older, um, but our documentation uh, stays pretty much the same there. 
Um, um, I could use some help again, please. Sure. Uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, share your screen. I don't know. I was open in the wrong folder and I was like so confused. So I'm here. Share your screen. Oh, I didn't? Mm -mm. Oh, it did. Okay. There we go. Okay. Um, so I don't like the fact that we've got um, an untitled folder going on over there. So I'm going to request remote. I'm going to just close out of, um, maybe I'm not. Okay, you are in the right folder here. So I'm going to delete this untitled folder. I'm going to close out of, uh, let's see, we're in the wrong place there. So if I open integrated terminal now, now I'm in the back end folder. So I can do my init dash y. That made me my package.json. Oh, okay. I can do my npm. Oh, why is that? Okay, never mind. Won't use the shortcut. npm install express cores uh, sequelize pg and bcrypt. I can make my server.js. Make sure I have the start node mon. Yep, you got it. I'm going to go here. We're going to add in our start. And we're going to do our node mon, uh, npx node mon server.js. And on the top, there is something about a module. Oh, good, good memory. We have to add in our uh, type as module. And now all you should need to do is get the server.js caught up and you'll be good to go. Gosh, thanks, Max. I'm sorry. I'm a little off tonight. No problem. These setups do become easier. The good news is you don't need to start a server from scratch all the time in the real world. Chances are your server will automatically or already be set up for you, and you'll be adding on to existing code when you start at a new company. However, it is important to get these steps down and, and not only uh, be comfortable with the steps, but knowing what those steps are doing. Hey, I'm, why are we doing this? Not just because Max said to do it, not just because his code is running. What is the point of each one of those steps? And so even though you may be sitting here and, and just waiting, go back through, make sure you understand, hey, what are those commands doing? If you have any questions, go ahead and ask. Brandon, go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, my, I, I keep trying to NPM start, but it keeps crashing, and I'm not sure where the issue may lie. Share your screen. Um, let's see. So you've got a module not found, which usually means that something did not install correctly. What's interesting, however, is... You have your package.json, and it has everything in it except ePress. We don't want ePress. We want Xpress. So we're going to remove ePress and install Xpress. And if that works, now when we do your start, you're good to go. OK, thank you. Spelling errors today. It's like most of you guys are voting in on the poll. If you haven't voted yet, go ahead and vote just so I know where we're at. Give everyone just one more minute before we roll forward here. A lot of steps for only uh, 13 lines of code, huh? <laughs> I 
all code from here on out. Gets a little bit, oh, except for the database. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, my server is on, but am I a uh, term manual? Oh, never mind. It's working now. No one is being weird. Okay, bye. <laughs> oh, Archell, it wasn't that funny. <laughs> It is to me because we say that at work all the time. <laughs> yeah, but the Same effect is so way. much better when you're pulling pulling a car out and going, okay, bye. <laughs> right. Oh, man. I'm going to talk about this at work tomorrow, just so you know. <laughs> all right. Last call. Does anyone need help? All right, we got one more setup step to do, and then the rest of it is code here on out. Code in the front end, code in the back end, code in this new thing called a model, but what's the last thing that we have to set up? Our database. So you are going to make sure you've got your little elephant up at the top. When you click on him, hopefully you've got a green check. You do, that means your Postgres is running. If you do not have an elephant, um, you can do your command space, type in Postgres, and that will pop open, oop, not Postman, Postgres. That will pop open your server here. Jordan, I swear to God, if it's not working. Mine says it's not running. I'm just, be I'm being a dick. You know, I stopped drinking this week, but if it wasn't working, you'd really be pushing me. Okay. So uh, once your database is running, we're going to switch over to Beekeeper. In Beekeeper, you get your little, your free trial expires in one day. We will deal with that on Monday when it starts causing us problems. For now, you can hit your little X on that. We're going to double click on your saved connection to get into your beekeeper. If your beekeeper already looks like this and you've got a drop down for your connection and maybe the teacher's table or some other table over on the left, that's fine, you're good to go. I'm gonna just close out of a couple older things here. And because we're starting a whole new project, I'm going to create a new database. Give me one second to do that because... Okay, so in my beekeeper, I should have a text area here. If you do not have a text area, you can hit the little plus up at the top here. That will open a new uh, query text editor tab for you. From there, we are going to do create database. And what are we going to call this database? We're gonna call it blog. I am then going to click on the run button. Do not forget to run that command. Then I'm going to go over to my drop down and click on my blog over here. If you do not have a blog in your top left drop down, hit the little refresh icon and then you should have blog. Now, last time, we had, to, we had to create our table. However, this time we're gonna use something called an ORM or an object relational mapper. What an ORM is going to let us do is write our code out in JavaScript and it's going to convert the JavaScript into SQL to automatically execute for us. Then when we need the data, it is going to map the relational database data into an object and vice versa. So it will take an object and map it into relational data as well. This is a two-way connection.
So we can dive into that in one second. Okay. So in order to get all of that set up, I'm going to minimize beekeeper here. We don't need beekeeper, but we will um, to look in to make sure everything's working under the hood, right? We've got three different places things can go wrong now. Our code can go wrong in the front end. The fetch might not be working. We don't have our state hooked up. We've got some error there. We could have an error in the back end, meaning our API isn't getting the right data or it's not executing the, the connection or um, there's some syntax error there. Or the issue could be in our database. Our database table model might be wrong. Our fields aren't lining up. Some information isn't actually saving into there. We have a syntax error. So when we start debugging, now we don't just debug in one place. We have to debug on the front end, on the back end, and in the database. And as our project progresses, you guys will see debugging at all three of those levels. Jordan, what's up? Sorry, I'm just not getting my Beekeeper Studio to... Um to uh connect log on yeah share your screen let's take a look um it's uh it's let me request remote did you hit the run button already exists. There you go. You just had to hit the refresh here in order for it mm. to show up in the drop down. OK. Thank you. No problem. Thought it was going to be much worse than it actually was. <laughs> take that as a win. OK, so now we've got all of our setup done. We've got our database created. Instead of using PG directly, we're going to use this thing called SQLize. And that's going to make it a little bit easier for us to write JavaScript that will interface directly with the database. But because we've got a couple different files that it takes to make this work, I'm going to create a new folder called DB. Make sure that folder is inside your blog front end. If it is, you can right click on DB and create a new file inside of that called db.js. Yes, I know it's a little confusing. The folder itself is called DB. The file is called db.js. Please make sure that this file is inside the DB folder. If you collapse the DB folder, that file should disappear. And when you reopen it, it should show up inside that db.js. That is super, super, super important that you have that inside that file. In the okay. back end, right? Uh, in the back end, yes. OK, so we don't put a db in the front end? No. OK. Our front end will never have access to our database can, uh, directly. It will only ever have access to our database through the back end. I don't know what I heard then. All righty. Inside our db.js, we've got a little bit more setup code we've got to do here. We're going to import SQLize from this package called SQLize. Should not have the curly braces. Sorry, autocomplete did me dirty there. Now that we've got SQLize imported, we have to get our database connection started. So we're going to say const db equals a new SQLize thing. And SQLize is like, great, where do you want to connect? However, SQLize works on a lot of different SQL databases. It works on MS SQL. It works on um, Oracle SQL. It works on MySQL. So we need to tell it, hey, you're going to connect here to a Postgres database. OK, now it's like, great, Where where is that database? What is the username that you're connecting in with? So I'm going to put in hack upstate here. 
this should be the default username that showed up in your Postgres app. So my Postgres app shows uh, hack update right here as my username. You want to match the casing on that. Do not uh, do spaces, do not do capitals. You want to match exactly what's showing up as your username, excuse me, exactly as your username in the Postgres app. From there, we don't have a password set, so we can tell it, hey, the server you're connecting to is on my local computer and it is running on port 5432. Then we need one more piece of information in here. What's the name of the database that we're connecting to? Well, we just created a database called blog. So we're gonna use that blog. Okay, now it's got all of this information, but just like in Postgres, we actually have to tell it to connect to the database. We wanted to actually go through, authenticate, make sure there aren't any errors. Um, and if there aren't any errors, uh, or if there are any errors, let us know there are, are problems. So to pull all of that off, we're going to do a new function called connect to DB. And that's going to be an async function that takes no parameters and no syntax errors. There we go. And we're going to tell the computer to try this out. What are we going to tell the computer to try? We're going to wait for the database to authenticate. And if it authenticates, well, we can console.log connected to DB successfully. Next. But, well, I'm yes. sorry. Could you uh, repeat one more time what connect to database does again? This is just a function, and we're defining what the function does inside the function itself. So what we're doing, it, the reason it needs to be in its own function is we need access to the async keyword. And then inside the function, we're authenticating with the database and logging out that we've connected successfully or we're going to catch an error. And if there is an error, console error out the error and also console.error something like panic database <laughs> problem. Okay, thank you. Now, because we made this function, like any other function, it won't run unless we tell it hey, go execute that connect to the database. No way to test if all of this is working yet, just a lot of code we're writing to set up our database connection. This is a little bit more robust than our um, PG code, right? Because what it's doing, it's trying to authenticate in, it's either giving us a success message or a failure message. Uh, it's helping us out a little bit um, to make sure that we know, hey, before our backup starts, which is so dependent on the database, let's make sure we can authenticate our way into it. The at localhost part, did you put that in or is that um, is that the your laptop thing? Um, localhost is all of our laptops. So localhost is your individual laptop. Um, that's the equivalent of say, saying 127.0.0.1. Uh, it's just saying, hey, go look on another port on this computer for the database server. So this is my first time um, seeing the console.error. What does mm -hmm. that do? So console.error is interesting. A lot of people know console log. Uh, people don't know there is also console.debug, console.error, console.info, and console.time and time end. And I'm sure there are others, but those are the only ones I can remember off the top of my head. Um, so basically, um, that should make our error show up in red in the terminal. But the real reason it's helpful is when you're writing a, uh, when you're creating a back end or even a front end, 
um, that may be tens or hundreds of thousands of lines of code, you may get lost in all of the console logs that are showing up. So you may say, hey, I don't care about all the info that's showing up. All I care about is whether there is an error in the console or not. If you flag it with this dot error, there are ways to filter the terminal down here to make sure that only the errors show, not all the miscellaneous infos and logs and that kind of stuff. So it's basically just a way to categorize what kind of, of uh, message is showing up in the console. Okay. So like an error message, pretty much. Yes. Thank you. Uh, was that question the console log errors like the first one or the second one? Because the first one, why isn't the first one in a string? Because this is an object coming from the error up here. Gotcha. So this is just telling us panic DB problem, but it's not really telling us what's wrong. This error is what is being caught from the try up here, and that's going to tell us what's wrong with the connection. So this is kind of the computer giving us the details of the error, and this is just a human readable error. So we know, hey, something's wrong. Hey, I just kind of have a, a, a general question. Is So this is basically similar in function to client in the previous project, right? Like with Postgres? Yes. yes. Why, why didn't we have to do that with that one? Is there any reason why like this one specifically, we, have to, we should use try catches? to check for errors or do you, um, are you just add to this one? You should be doing that if you were using the Postgres uh, uh, package directly. Um, the reason why we're doing a try catch um, is uh, if you uh, deployed the PG package um, and your database was working fine locally, but wasn't working when you uh, deployed it to your backend server, it may not give you any errors when it tries to connect to the database. It may just say, hey, something's not starting up right. Go figure out why. And you would have to kind of test every line of code. But if you had that in a try catch, you would say you would see there's a database problem and be able to narrow it down into that directly and figure out what's wrong with that database connection. Um, so a try catch is good whenever there is the potential for an error to be thrown. It allows you to catch that error and handle it yourself as opposed to it crashing the whole application. Got it. Thank you. Basically, whenever we're running code that we don't have control over, but it may throw an error, we like to be able to handle it ourselves as opposed to it crashing everything out. I'm sorry, was there an issue with the live share? It says that you have disconnected from collaboration session due to connectivity problems or the host going offline. Does anyone else this can? Oh. Um, I, is anyone else disconnected? I would just try. Um, uh, reopening the link from Slack Alba and seeing if that brings it back in. Because it looks like everything's running fine on my side. Okay. All right. So anyone need another minute or have any questions about this code? Remember, it's not just about being able to write it. It's about being able to read it and explain it and saying, hey, I can tell you what every line of code is doing here. Uh, general question, uh, the line on import, does it have to be capitalized for that S? Um, uh, it doesn't have to be. This one has to be lowercase because it's the name of the package. This one doesn't have to be uppercase, but whatever case you have here needs to match here. Gotcha. Okay. I don't know. I kind of know why I I capitalize that. Um, I capitalize it in my code traditionally because whenever you're using this new keyword, you're using object-oriented programming there, which is not a particularly popular design pattern in JavaScript, even though JavaScript fully supports it. Um, and so um, 
the reason I do a capital S here is because it uses that new keyword to construct the SQLize object. And because of that, I capitalize it. If it were a function, um, I would lowercase it. But that is that is personal preference and probably somewhat of an industry standard, but not a requirement. You could totally lowercase it here as long as you also lowercase it down here. Artro, what's up? So I'm I'm playing catch up based off of the uh, the link you put in for the back end. Mm -hmm. Now I'm assuming you did the front end first, right? The front end is coming from week 15, day two. Oh, week 15. Or the, or the zip file that I posted in the live stream. Okay, yeah, I got in late, so I didn't see the live. I, I missed part of the live stream because I got in late. In the the Slack live stream, there should be the zip file in there. It's called blog.zip. That is the front end. So I could just copy it and put it in there then. You got it. All right. Thank you. We haven't modified anything in the front end code. All we did is our NPM install and our NPM start. Okay. So I'll, I'll wait to do that stuff before I put that stuff in. Cool. Thank you. Okay. We've got this whole file kind of hanging out here but we need to be able to access this file in our server.js because our server.js is what kicks everything off, right? That's the thing that's actually running. So in order to do that, what we do is we say export our database from here. Because we are exporting it from our database file, we're able to import it in other files. The way we do that is we switch back. Once we get our export DB here, we go back to the server JS and up at the top, we can now import our DB from, and now our db.js is inside this DB file folder. So we need to say DB slash DB. And for the moment of truth, when you save that file, you should have a connected to DB successfully in your terminal. If you do not, we just wrote 17 lines of code that could have all gone horribly wrong. So if you have a connected to DB successfully, pat yourself on the back, go back, reread the code, make sure you understand it. If you do not have a connected to DB successfully and you have no idea why, raise your hand and I can help you. Our trail, what's up? All right. So as you know, I'm playing catch up. Um, so your db.js is inside of a folder called db? Yes. Okay. I didn't create that folder, but I do have I have a db with what we just wrote there. All right. So create a folder and then drag it up into that? Yes. And the reason why we put it in a folder is we're going to have other files that are all related to the database. So we try and keep everything kind of clustered together in that database folder. Okay. Thank you. If possible, could you show us um, what would happen if we got an error? I just want to see how that would play out. Sure. So I'm going to connect to my blue instead of my blog. And when I hit save, we have panic DB problem. And then if you scroll up, you can see the output of our console error error here is all of this information about the fatal connection. And if you scroll up even further, you can see database blue does not exist. So if okay. I go back and put my G in there and always remember to scroll down to the bottom of the terminal, we get our connected to DB successfully. Thank you. Thank you. Great question. Exona, what's up? Um, <clears throat> my terminal says Nodemon app crashed waiting for file changes before starting. So always read the error above that. What is causing the file to crash? Error module not found. Okay. So does your database.js on line 17-ish have your export DB? Uh, for export, yes. Okay. Then I share your screen.
Mm. Don't see any problems there. So let me go to your server JS. And I don't see any problem there. So what's it yelling about? Miss the JS next to the DB import. Yeah. Um it normally doesn't matter. I I will say that it did get like even though I auto completed it and it and it did it without the JS, it, it did kind of throw me some errors until I added the JS. So I don't oh, know. What that's about. Neither do I. Um although the dot JS does seem to fix it. So <laughs> I would just let it ride on the .js, okay. and then I will put it on my list to look into why the JS is required there, because I actually don't know. Yeah, I was going to ask because I thought that JavaScript files didn't need that extension in other JavaScript files, but you know, I thought maybe I had it wrong. Cool. Um. One of the most important things for any developer to be able to say is, I don't know, but you always follow that up with, I'll get back to you on that. And sometimes you get back to the person and you say, I still don't know, but um, I will look into that and get back to you. Okay, thank you. I actually just put it on there because I thought it might be a little bit easier for you guys to understand, like DB is the folder and then the .js is the file that, the, that you're importing. Um, but yeah, I will look into it and let you know. Jordan, what's up? Sorry, I thought my camera was on too. Um, is mine is saying error address already in use? Make sure that you don't have any other terminals running from yesterday's code. I don't. Okay, share the screen. This is a, a good one for everyone to pay attention to. Sometimes you get some uh, zombie uh, servers running where you really don't, you close out everything, you can't find it anywhere. And it's just telling you 3000 is already being run. There are two places to check. One is this over here acts as, uh, come on, this over here acts as uh, different terminal tabs that you have open. So if I go to this one, you can see this is already running over here. We don't want it running in this one or in this one. We want it running on this one down here. So I'm going to just delete out these two. And now if we control C to stop and up enter to start, we are back in business and up and running. Although we don't have your database connected. And because it's you that's scaring me, um, let me just throw in your import here to make sure that that is working for you. Is it in the right spot? Is the db and db.js in the right spot? Or? It is. Yeah, you just uh, missed this one last import that we added to the server.js. Ah. Uh. I knew it. I knew you were going to be a problem. <laughs> uh, OK, you put hack up C here but it needs to be your own username. Ah. Uh, and you're good to go. Awesome, thank you. Jennifer, what's going on? I'm going to share my screen. It's not giving me that message. So you are missing the slash after the first period in line three. Good to go. Thank you. No problem. Shiner, what's hey, up? Max. I'm oh, sorry. You're next, Alba. Shiner, what's up? Why do we put the curly braces in there? Oh, 
you are the king of good questions tonight. Okay, so we put the curly braces in there because um, we have the curly braces in here. And so if you guys are feeling pretty confident about your JavaScript, listen in. If you're like, I'm just going along for the ride tonight, just put on the earmuffs and tune out. So the reason why we do our um, export there is because um, we export an object here, which means we also need to import from that object here. The reason we did that is if I wanted to add something like str equals test, I am able to export that str here, which means I am able to import it here, which means I can console log it here and get that test string to show up. If we did not do these curly braces here, I could export my str. The problem is, is that if I need to make it match here. So if I do export default str, now you can see my test string is running, but I can't export both the str and the database. So. In order to fix that, we can only ever export one thing, but that one thing can be an object with multiple things in it. And so the way that we fix that is we export both str and db, and now we make that match over here. And because of that, we can now access both the string and the database itself. No limit to how much you can put in those uh, parameters? No limit to what to how much you can put in the object as long as it is in one object and only one object. So gotcha. this is called an um this is called a uh expli uh an explicit export as opposed to when we do something like this. Um this is called the default export. So when we just take whatever the default thing coming out of the export is. Um, we don't need the curly braces, but if we are taking multiple things out of it, it's actually using object destructuring in order to get access to all of the individual things coming out of that one object that we're exporting. I get the gist more or less. That's all we're going for at, at, at this point. Um, it is a, a good question, though. Um, the reason why we do the curly braces here is we will be exporting multiple things from the uh, database file as our project grows. Good question. Uh, Alba, what's going on? I was finally able to get back into the live um, share. What was it? that I'm supposed to look for to make sure that it's working? Uh, db.js, make sure you've got that whole file in there. Make sure you've got your import db from db, db.js. And then down at the console, you should have connected to db successfully. I have all of that. The only thing that I saw that was weird was that um, the import on the server up top is kind of faded. It's not really. That's fine. Okay. For for now, we'll we'll get to that in a second. All right. How are we feeling? Take a minute here. Go back through the code. Take a breather. See if you understand the general flow of this. I know it's the first time getting into SQLize. We just made our own file. We've got a lot of different things going on here. Just take a minute. Read through this code. See if there are any questions that pop up. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Maybe this might be. Um, why? Why is it? Why does it say const connected to async, then try and then await and then catch? What is yeah. what is it trying to do? Like I'm not understanding it. Well, it's catching it. Catching what? Catching the console error. I'm kidding. So, um, those are two separate questions. So pull pull it apart. 
The reason why we did connect to DB here in its own function is because I need to await for the database to authenticate before I can console log out my connected message. So because we need to use the await keyword, we're not to we're not allowed to use await unless it's in an async function. Right. So the reason why we have all of this connect to DB and we call it down here is just so that we can put the whole thing in an async so that we can make the await work. Okay. That's question one. That's kind of independent from the try and the catch. What mm -hmm. a try and a catch is, is this is going back to um, some obscure free code camp assignment that you probably did two or three challenges on and move through. Um, we haven't used a ton of try and catch in class. What it's doing is it's saying, try this code, try and authenticate, and only if the authenticate works, console log this out. Okay, okay. well, that's kind of standard JavaScript. But what may happen is to use a question uh, Schneider asks, what happens if I spell blog wrong? Okay. Well, what's happening is it is throwing an error on the authenticate. Don't ask me why they use the word throw, but whenever an error shows up, it throws that error at you. And so what we do is we say, well, try this. And if there is no error, ignore these two lines. They never happen. It's kind of like an if statement. A try catch is like an if there is an error running this code, then catch it and do this thing down here. And so that's what the try catch is doing is it's catching the error that gets thrown in the authenticate and then we can do anything with it. We could comment this out and say console.log. Everything is awesome. And now we get everything is awesome down here, even though I spelled blog wrong. So it's kind of a way to say, hey, if something goes wrong up here, don't do the default behavior. Give me a heads up. Go do this other thing instead um, when that error gets thrown. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yep. Oh, come on. Now I'm going to delete out my everything is awesome before I have the Lego song stuck in my head all evening. It already got stuck in my head. Um, my other question is, how do you know to, how do you know to set up that URL, the Postgres part, really? Great question. Schneider, you're on a roll tonight. Yeah. Um, if you go in to, if you do a Google search for SQLize um, and click in, you can see some of the steps we've already done. We did our install command. We didn't use SQLite because we're using Postgres instead. Um, but if you go down here, uh, we're going to do this define models uh, step next. That's what's coming, uh, coming up. But if you go into the API... Ref, no, I think it's this one. If you go to V6 stable and click on it, you can see here's all this documentation. And as part of that documentation, um, over in the maybe getting started. Yes, in the getting started connected to database, you can see where they document all of that information out for you. Docs, gotcha. Thank you. Yes, TLDR, typical for me. Uh, docs, docs are always going to be the answer. And I will be referencing these um, as we start coding along because there even comes a point where the great almighty wizard Max does not keep all of this stuff in his head. He's got to reference the docs. So um, and that is a great thing. If you've got five minutes at the end of class, not only go through and read your code, but if you're curious, see if you can find that information in the docs because 99% of the time it will be in there. Okay, we've got 10 minutes till break. We are going to add in one more thing and that is our first model. So we create a model because JavaScript needs to know what our database looks like. In other words, the model we are creating is telling JavaScript what the model of the table looks like in our SQL database. 
So in order to do that, we're working all in this block, right? And we're going to create more models as we go, especially for the user. But for right now, we're going to add a new file. Again, make sure it is inside your DB folder. The easiest way to do that is instead of just clicking the new file button, right click on your DB folder and do a new file in there. And we're going to create a new one called post.js. Now, we need to import something called data types. And we import data types from SQLize. This is allowing us to specify using the SQLize uh, library what kind of data that we have in our columns. We then say our const post is going to take this parameter called db. And db is going to return db.define. Define is the uh, function that we use in order to define what the model looks like. Now we need to tell it what is the name of the table? What is the name of this model? So we call that post. And then we've got to tell it what the post looks like. So we come in here and we say, hey, first and foremost, we've got an ID. An ID is kind of unique because it takes a couple pieces of information. First of all, it needs to know the type, which is going to be our data type dot integer. It also needs to know that it is the primary key. And whoa. Where did that come from? Primary key true. And it also needs to know to auto increment. We put that ID in almost every single model. The reason why we do that is so SQLize knows not only to auto generate, auto increment the ID, but also to treat it as a primary key unless we, in case we reference that ID somewhere else. And every single column, every single item in our model needs to have a type associated with it. This type is an integer. Our uh, IDs are almost always integers using a SQL database. OK, now we're like, all right, got our ID. What else should be in our table? Well, we could think of that off the top of our head, or we could go back over to our front end, which is already mostly built, and take a look inside the post editor. The post editor has this thing called title, tagline, and content. That, to me, seems like a good thing to, to model our database off of. So we try and be consistent across the front end and the back end, uh, and the database. We don't have to be. We can kind of create translations between them. But consistency is almost always a good thing uh, in terms of getting our, our code to be more readable, more understandable. So I'm going to come back here, and I'm going to create my title. And this is going to be a data type of a string. We are also going to create our tagline which is also going to be a data type of a string. And now I'm going to throw you a curveball. The content is not going to be a data type of a string. It's going to be a data type of text. OK, why does that matter? Because for whatever reason, under the hood, it's important, databases don't like to store large chunks of text. So a string is limited to 255 characters. Well, for our title and our tagline, 255 characters probably isn't a problem, right? That's three or four sentences. We're probably OK with that. However, our content could certainly be more than a couple sentences. So for that reason, we store that as a data type dot text.
Quick, quick question, Max. I, I think my editor automatically imported uh, the DB file. Is that okay? Or No, you're going to get a circular reference there. The DB is getting passed in as a parameter, and we're going to see how it does that in a second. Um, but that's, for what, that's now, what I was thinking. So that's why I thought it was odd that it completed it because, yeah, I was thinking that it would get passed in. But all right, just wanted to make sure. Thanks. Yep, only one import or import of a data type. I'm just going to do two more steps here, and then we'll go on break. We need to add an export, and we are going to export out the default thing as the post. The reason why we're saying default here is so we don't need curly braces when we import it. So we are going to export our default post down at the bottom. Then we're going to go back to our db.js. And now, instead of just importing SQLize, we're also going to import our post from our post.js. We are then going to come down here after um, our connected to DB successfully. And we're going to make our post get access to the database. We are also going to do this new function called db.sync. So th uh, four steps that we did. We exported our default post from post.js. We imported our post up at the top. We then came down and gave our post access to the DB that we connected to and authenticated to up here. And then finally, we told the database to sync. Fun fact, in middle school, my iPod was called uh, the Titanic. So whenever I plugged it into the computer, it said the Titanic is sinking. Sorry, you get one dad joke a night, at least. All right. If all of this is working, you should get something down in the terminal that's a whole heck of a lot of SQL. OK, yeah, it's a lot of SQL, but check out what's going on down, going on down there. Create table, if not exists, posts with our ID serial and our title and varchar. That looks familiar. And our, all of our information in here, that's kind of interesting. But that's SQL. If that means it's SQL, when I go over to my beekeeper and I hit the refresh button here, the refresh button down here, sorry, beekeeper loves their refresh buttons. It's not the top one. It's the one down here on, on entities. Oh, where did that post table come from? If I pop that open, I can see, whoa, there's my ID, my title, my tagline, and my content, plus two freebies, the created at and updated at. Whoa, what just happened there? Our JavaScript defined what the model looked like. It was saying, hey, the table in Postgres is going to look like this file. And if we get this file configured properly, when we sync that into the database, it will automatically create all of those columns for us. Now that model is gonna be even more powerful when we come back from the break. Brian, what's up? I'm just a little curious. So the, the table is created in that db.define function thing, right? Yes. Okay, so it defined it as post, but it created the table as post plural. So should this always be, we should always name it the singular 
uh, this is way of a, calling that thing. This is a yeah. widely contested question of should the table name be singular or plural? In SQLize, they say to use singular here, and they will automatically pluralize it uh, over in the table name itself. Got it. So if you if we were to put posts in that define, it would be like posts. No, <laughs> the, just, pluralize, it... the pluralized library is actually smart enough um, oh, to okay. not only not add multiple S's, but if you define your table name as something that gets like an ES, um, it will actually do that for you. So if I call this like messages or message, and I come over here and look in the database, you will see that, oh, that's a bad example. Um, what, what requires an ES? Uh, Why scores, but you wouldn't have scores. Is, is. Um, why is that so hard to think of? Words, plural, is the sound a spot? <laughs> words that need es, um, buses. So if I do bus here, it will actually do the smart thing and call it buses with an es on the end of it. That is actually, this is a, a deep, a rabbit hole you didn't know you were sending me down. That actually uses a library called Pluralize, which is downloaded uh, 7.8 million times a week. And one of the contributors is me. I actually found there was a word that needed a different pluralization. Um, I believe it was the thesauruses. Thesauruses were not properly adding the ES to it, and it broke my code in ways I cannot begin to under uh, to explain. So I actually went in here and added a a pull request in, and they accepted it. So thesaurus now turns into thesauruses as it's supposed to. But this will handle things like you know, what's the plural of, of something that you add like an I onto the end of it or like, you know, the weird, the weird exceptions there. Quiz becomes quizzes with two Zs. That is literally everything that this, this package does. Very interesting. Uh, yeah. I was, I was curious, like, how did that seems like such a granular thing? Like, cause I was thinking before you showed me that I'm like, man, they coded that into the package, man, that seems so specific, but like, it's just crazy to think that there's like these very specific, you know, functions and that you can just loop in and yeah, thank you. I like, thank you for that explanation. Very, very deep dive and you, you scratch the surface on a package that I have bought with uh, for a long time. Um, and instead of just writing two lines of code to just say, if it's thesaurus, pluralize it properly. Uh, instead, I opened a pull request with that library, and I'm curious. I think you can even find that plural. Uh, no, it's not in the package lock.json. But yes, that is a deep dive to say that they intelligently add an S for you. Alba, what's going on? Um... I think I'm fine, but I missed the part on how to check in the blog. I mean, in Beekeeper. If you go to Beekeeper, make sure your top left drop down is set to blog here. And if it is, you should see a posts table with all the columns under it. If you don't, make sure you hit the little refresh button to the right of entities. Not the top one on blog, but down kind of hover over entities. If you click on that, that should bring up your table. If it doesn't, something's not working. Something's not working for me. Up to you next, Alba. Any luck? It just says buses. Oh, that's fine. Sorry. <laughs> Go back, but go back to your code and in the post, change the line four back to post. And which one? Uh, in in post.js post on line four, that should say post. 
My bad. Sorry, I should have said don't follow along here. I was typing and I, <laughs> I was typing, so I um I was kind of like trying to get all the code in, so I didn't notice. Why do we have buses in our blog posts? I'm so confused. <laughs> I have three of them. It says buses, bottles, posts. As long as you got the posts, that's a, all that really matters. Just to show you uh, why open source is cool, this package hasn't been updated since October 7th, 2021. Look at who updated it last. So you can actually see exactly what I did here. Oh, it was Canvas. It wasn't Thesaurus. The canvas was not properly turning into canvases with an ES on the end of it. And you can actually see the file that I changed in order to make sure that canvas was included as an ES word. OK, sorry. Little open source brag there. Uh, Jordan, what's going on? Other than you being I have no idea. Um, it's saying that there was a problem database blog already exists on beekeeper still. And then it's also saying panic database problem on my, um, integrated terminal. Share your screen and everyone else can go on break. We'll see you at 735. Someone else is sharing their screen. Oh, that asshole. <laughs> um, okay. So you request remote. And then you can do it. Um, is that another user? Some fatal error. I fixed this once. I'm going to fix it again. This <laughs> shouldn't say hack up state. Oh, again, I did it. Okay. Yeah. Because I copied and pasted that last section that last time because I missed what to type in. So now you got a different error. That says permission denied. I hate everything. Um, okay, refresh. What? Mm -hmm. Well, what the? Blog. Okay. Um, Postgres add default user to every database. Um, Grant schema user to uh, oh, I don't know that I want to do that. Um, can I just uh, all right? What happens if I? Okay, whenever I say use your username, don't listen to me. You are the exception. You should use Postgres as your username every time. Okay. I hope. Refresh. Yes, everything's in there. So you're good to go now. Um, just use Postgres as your username uh, because your user account, for whatever reason, doesn't like to authenticate. So we use kind of the super admin username for you. Okay. But you're all caught up, so good work. Okay, thank you. Artrell, what's up? Trying to get my terminal set up on my VS Code. Okay, Max. Um, share your screen. Let's see if it works today.
Ah! Foiled again. But let me tell you what's going on, though. Go for it. So in the back end VS Code, the last time where it seemed to be working fine is I did the, uh, what did I do? The NPM init dash Y. That yep. worked. Um, then I did the NPM I dash S express PG body parser core SQLize. That worked. Then I tried NPM start. Then I got a bunch of NPM errors. Did you add in your package.json the npx nodemon server.js? In the package.json? Yeah. Uh, yes. All right. I should say um, start colon uh, npx nodemon. Yes, server.js. I did that. Okay. Um, and you've got a comma at the end of line eight. Yes. Now, here's where it's interesting. So in line 15, on mine originally, well, in yours it says bcrypt yep. version. Five. On mine, it originally said body parser. So what I try to do is just um, comment that out. So I wasn't sure if I needed to delete it altogether or not. You need to delete it. Comments don't work in JSON files. Okay, so I'm going to delete. So that should be gone, the body parser? Yep. All right. All right, so I'm going to delete that out completely right now. And then do you have bcrypt cores express PG SQLize? Recap course, except, yes. Okay, so save that and then see if your NPM start will work in the terminal. It did. Then it said app crash, waiting for file changes before starting. See, that's that was, the, that was what it was. That, but I figured, let me try to be proactive and use my, you know, my hat. Let me try to comment this so out. Scroll up and read me, figure out what the error is that's making it crash. All right. So we got installed, NodeMon starting NodeMon. Then it said file, JS15, export DB, syntax error, export DB is not defined in module. So, so it's showing in the post.js. So I'm going to go to my post.js line 16, export space, curly brace. Mm -mm. DB, I don't put the spaces between the DB and the curly braces. In in, in post.js, look yes. at what my post.js is. It should be export default post on 16. Wait, hold on. Um, am I in the right one? Let's see. Now, what did I put yours? Um, I'm screen sharing if that's easier. All right, thank you. So, hold on. Lines export in the post. Okay, I think you weren't in the page when I was writing that, and that's where I got lost. Okay, export. Default. Post. Now, because we have that there, um, I don't have to have the import up top. That just goes in the, uh, the db.js, right? The import, you should have one import at the top. It says import data types. I have that one, but the import that's it. post, yep. that's just on the um, db.js. DB yes. Okay. All right. So I'm going to save that. Now it looks like it's still running. This is waiting for child changes before starting. So I'm going to leave it alone for now. Uh, 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 great. Scroll all the way down to the bottom. If it still says waiting for change, you need to scroll up and figure out what the latest error is. No, I'm sorry. Last one, it says crash, waiting for file changes before starting, right? And then it's a new line. So control C to stop it. Control C to stop it and then up enter to restart it. All right. It did it, then it crashed again. Let's see. Uh, JS import data type from SQLize. No, since the requested module SQLize does not provide an export name data type. Okay, so make sure that you've got the curly braces in post.js around line one around the data types. I do around data type, I do. And you have from SQLize and it's a lowercase s. Yep, I'm look at yours. Is that do you find? Post ID curly brace type integer primary 
Yeah, I don't have any red line of code on this page. Do you have the capital T in types? I do. Oh, I have it single. I have data type as opposed to data types. There you go. All right. All right. Now we're on the bottom in the terminals has connected to DB successfully. Then you are all caught up. Now can I do N now can I do NPM start on this or no? You I already did. did. Duh. All right. All right. Good work. Okay, bye. <laughs> so let's do a quick review of this. So we got started with our file setup. We did our npm init. That got us our package.json. Then we did our npm install, and we installed bcrypt cores, express pg, and sqlize. OK, all of that's going good. Now we say, all right, now we got to use that code somewhere. So cr we create our server.js. Inside our server.js, we import express and cores. Then we say, OK, we make a new server, a new express server, and we tell our server to use cores. Once it's using cores, we create our first endpoint. That's our server.get. And we make our rec and our res. And we just res.send back welcome to my blog API. So before we even touch the database, we want to fire up our server on 3001 and then console log out that the server is running. If all of that is wor working, we can see uh, our server running on port 3001 here. And if we go over to our browser and look at 3001, we can get our message showing up there. So we're good to go there. Now we go, all right, now we want to layer in the database. So we make this new file called db.js, and we import a couple things. We import SQLize. We'll come back to post in a second. And we give SQLize the connection string. Hey, where are you connecting in? Um, we say, OK, you're going to connect to Postgres. And when you're in Postgres, you're going to use our username and our port and then whatever database that we created for this project in uh, Beekeeper. We save that in this thing called DB, but now we've got to use the database. And in order to authenticate with the database and make sure everything connected successfully, we need this in an async function. Because of that, we create this function called uh, called connect to DB, and we call it immediately. We call it right down here. OK, well, what are we going to try to do in this connect to DB? We're going to try to authenticate. And if we can authenticate, say that we've connected successfully. But if we can't authenticate, if this connection isn't working, catch whatever error is thrown and throw it out onto the console so we know it didn't work. OK, then we export our DB so that we can import our DB over in our server.js file. Pausing there, any questions on the express setup or the initial SQLize setup? We haven't gotten to the models quite yet. I mean, post DB and db.sync. That's the models. We haven't gotten to oh, those yet. Okay. OK, so now we get to the models. Now we've got this import post.js. What's the whole point of that? This is we put it in a separate file. It technically doesn't need to be in a separate file. But because we have more and more code here, it makes sense to break it out a little bit more. This is the model. Think about a, a, a toy car, right? That toy car is a scale model for what actually is happening when the car gets made. The same goes here. This is a model that we're making in our JavaScript so that by the time it gets to the SQL database, the JavaScript knows what the database looks like. That's what we're doing here. So we set up this post and we define it. We are defining what the model looks like. We provide the singular table name, and then we put in these fields. ID is a special one because it needs um, not just the data type, but the primary key and the auto increment. And then we put in our other data items that we know that we're storing from the front end. Then we export this out. So in our db.js, we can import it. And once we've got that post imported, we pass the database that we've already authenticated and connected into 
into our post. So this post goes to this post, this post goes to this post, this post comes from the export, which goes to this, which connects into the DB. So our DB that we're defining right here connects all the way up to this DB that we started right here. Once we do that, we then tell the database to sync because this post table may not have existed already. If it doesn't exist, what it does is automatically creates the ID, title, tagline, and content columns for us inside our new post table. And if we go to Beekeeper, we can see it created all of that for us. That should catch us up to everything we've written so far. Does anyone have questions on any of that? I wouldn't mind you going over that model again. That was a little quick. So our model, we import the data types in. The data types are coming in from SQLize. So SQLize is taking care of providing us a list of all the different options. In fact, if you uh, use the autocomplete, you can see what all the different data types are that, that SQLize supports. Um, integer is one of them. Um, so we say, hey, we're going to make a new const. That const, this is going to be the function that defines our model. In that, we get access to the database. The database is getting passed in when we call this function. The define is defining out what the table looks like. The post is the table name. And then any key in here is going to become its own column. So the keys in this object are used as the column names. And if there's only one thing in the value for those keys, uh, in this type, it's the data type. It assumes that it is the data type. If we have more information than just the data type that we need to specify, like primary key and auto increment, we include it in this object. Mm -hmm. I meant like how to um, how DB connects, um, like from the DB file, db.js, mm -hmm. and how it just all connects into post.js. Well, the post is exported here, uh -huh. and it's imported here. Mm -hmm. Then we call it down here. Gotcha. I feel like you're you might be putting more behind that than there actually is. Maybe I'm just overthinking it, honestly. So think about this as the export is the equivalent of kind of taking this whole thing and copying it and pasting it where this import is. So that's essentially what the import export is doing. It's essentially allowing us to access this post inside another file. This one happens to be db.js. So wherever, whatever you're exporting here is kind of telling it what you get access to in here. And wherever you uh, import it here is telling it where, where to suck that function in. And then the DB that we create here is just passed in via the parameter right here. So that when we call the define function, it's all happening on the database that we've already connected to. Artrell, what's up? All right, as I'm looking at my, um, my beekeeper, since I'm kind of caught up, I don't have, uh, public or post, but I do have information schema. And did you click on this refresh button on the entities? I don't believe I did. Um, next to entities, I have a plus button, but not a refresh. Share your screen. Oh, you have to hover over the word entities in order to get the refresh to show up. Oh, okay. I, I just refreshed it. I I only I don't have that those two. Okay, tools. share your screen. Let's take a look. Uh you can't share your screen. Um, do you have the DB dot sync on line twelve in DB dot JS? Hold on. All right, DB dot JS line twelve. Um, 
uh, I have the console dot error panic DB problem. Okay, so we've got two lines in there. We've got our post DB and our DB dot sync. All right, so you're in DB in the back end, right? All right, so I'm yep. in the back end. All right, hold on. So post try console log after the catch. All right, yeah, so I missed something. So after the console I'll log. And we also have an import all the way up on line two, so it knows where post is coming from. I have that import. Okay. Post db, and then there's a db sync. So creating the file isn't enough. Importing it isn't enough. We've got to give the post access to the database. And then we've got to tell it, hey, if those tables don't exist yet, go ahead and create them for us. All right, I'm going to try to refresh it again. Not there, but in the console log, after I added those, Max, it says panic DB problem. So scroll up, what's the error there? Okay, data type is not defined at posts, post.js 6-3. Uh, so make sure all of your data types are plural in your post.js. All right, hold on. Nope. So the type is data type instead of data types. All right. Um, all the other ones are S's. And then I got a whole lot of code in the terminal. Server running, executing default select and salt, and uh, executing default select. It's a whole lot of stuff. I'm going to go back to my beekeeper. I'm going to refresh. My public and post are there now. Good. Good work. Thank you. All right. Anyone else have questions? OK, so now we get to make all of this work. We've done all the hard work. We've done all the setup. Now we need to do our CRUD. So with our CRUD, we usually start with either a create or a read. We're going to start with the create this time. So I'm going to go back over to my front end code, my long neglected front end code that we forgot about. And I'm going to open up the post editor. Now, right now, our post editor is, if you had a, a block of code in here with the use effect, you can take that out. Excuse me, that was just an example that I was doing for the use effect. OK, so our add post, we do all of this work to get the title, tagline, and content into an object. But right now, we are doing all of this stuff with local storage. Well, we don't want this in local storage anymore, because why? what's the limitation with local storage? Why are we even learning this whole backend database thing? You know, persistence. Yeah. The persistence is one of them. And local storage is a little persistent, right? Like our blog posts from the last time we worked on this are, are still there. But it's more about the multi-user aspect of it, right? We want multiple people to be able to either create blog posts or view our page and still get all the blog posts that have been created. So where, as painful as it is, we are going to delete out uh, number 11 for me in the comments, that's line 31, all the way down to the navigate to, but not including the navigate to. So we are starting at line 31 on my screen and going down to line 50. We're going to go ahead and nuke all of those out, delete them out. So the only thing that you should have left in that is our prevent default, the thing that makes the post, our console log post and the navigate to. Now we get to the fun part of replacing all of that. So we're going to do a const response equals await. And because I'm using an await, I know I need my async up in the function line 13. And then how do I get to the back end? I fetch. And where am I going to fetch to? I'm going to fetch to HTTP localhost 3001, 
And then I'm like, uh, what am I fetching to? Well, I don't really have anything created for that yet. So I'm going to say post. And then we got to give it some information. Well, we know we want our method to probably be a post method type because we're creating something new in the database. We're not editing, we're not getting, we're not putting, we're not deleting, we're posting a new blog post. And we need to give it a heads up in the headers that what we're sending in is the content type of application JSON. And then in the body, we are going to send in a JSON stringify of our post. Where's this post coming from? That's this object that we already constructed right here. Okay, so we've done all of that work. Give you one more minute. I see a lot of eyes flitting around. Do you have any errors in your terminal? I have a warning, but no error. We have a, a wait without a async. I do not because I put my async up on line 13. You know, I'm sorry, I missed where we were supposed to delete like er everything before navigate to or well, not everything, but every, uh, everything between uh, navigate to and the console log post. If you don't have the console log, it's uh, the object above it. So this 31 through 37 is the only new section of code except for the async op on line 13. So we don't really have any way to test this yet. Why not? Well, we just did this fetch on our front end, but now we've got to go make this post work on the back end. So we switch over to our back end. I head back over to my server.js. And what do I set up there? I'm going to say server.post. Why is it a post? Because I need it to line up here. Now, what's the URL? slash post because I'm making a new blog post. Okay, now I know I'm gonna have my async rec res. Why is it gonna be async? Because I'm gonna wait something in the database. What am I gonna wait in the database? Well, before we would do our PG dot query, right? And we'd have to write out this long template literal and get the insert right and make sure our quotes are all lining up and all of that stuff. But instead of using PG, 
we can actually pull in the post. And we want to pull the post in from our DB file. So we actually have to go back to our db.js and add in our post as an export. So we add our export on db.js. We do a comma and we add our post. Then in our server.js, we can then import our post from the database. So the only change in db.js, we add a comma in the export and we add the post into that. Then from our server.js, we can import the post from right here. Because of that, we can then use the post and use something called create. And what are we creating? We're creating a post from the information that's in the rec.body. Whoa, 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 where did the rec.body come from? That is our post, which has all of the data from the front end being sent in the body of the request. So we get our post.create rec.body, and then all we need to do is res.send something back like status, okay. And because we're doing it in the database, we should probably await it. <laughs> so recap summary, we got our fetch going on in the front end right here. That is making our uh, post request to the post endpoint with the headers telling the server that JSON is headed its way and stringifying out the post that we generated up here from our previous code. From there, we need access to the post in this file. So we go into our db.js and we add in this post as an export. Once we've got that in there, we can go over to our server.js and add the post import. Very important to note that this post import needs to come from our db.js file. It cannot come from the post.js file. So make sure your post is getting imported from db.js, not from post.js. Once you've got your post in here, we came down and we made a new endpoint. We made it asynchronous so that it can write to the database. And we said post.create. Now, instead of having to write out a long insert into posts and include the, the column names and the fields, we can just dump in the request body. Once we do all of that, we just send back res.send uh, res status OK. Once we do all of that work, there's one thing I forgot in the server setup. In addition to telling the server that it can use cores, the server also needs a heads up that it should use express.json. That this is important because we won't have access to our rec.body until we tell the server to par parse as JSON. I'm gonna give you a couple minutes to catch up here, but if everything is working, we should be able to go in to our front end, go to the post editor, type in something and hit post. And post.create is not a function. Okay, is it per post.insert? Try that again. Post.insert is not a function. OK, just create a complete liar out of me. 
is what happens when you write code from memory. Um, No, it was create. Oh, crap. Uh -huh. Stand by technical difficulties. A professional who knows what he's doing, mostly. Okay, hold on. I've got a fix coming for you guys. Okay, so here's the problem. We kind of have two posts going on here. We've got a import of our post that's pulling in the function that we made in our post.js, right? But the problem is, is that at this point, the database does the the post does not have access to the database. The point where the post gets access to the database is right here. So really, what I want to do is get access to this thing called like post DB. The problem with doing that, though, is I can't get access to it in the export because it's in the scope of connect to DB. So we got to move some things around here. What I propose is that we take this post DB and we move it outside of our try. And we're actually going to throw it right under the DB here. And what we're going to do is we're going to rename our post import as post model. Then we can say our const post is equal to our post model db. OK, let me go over that one more time. 
we had our post parentheses DB in here. The problem is, is we needed access to that outside of the connect to DB function. In order to pull that off, we renamed our import up here to post model. Because we renamed it to post model, we put our post model DB here that gave us access to the post that is connected to the database. Now, because of that, we are still exporting out our post, but now we're exporting out the post that actually is already connected to the database. Because of that, in our server.js, when we import the post, we're importing the post that is already connected so we can use our post.create here. So the big change there is we took out our DB, our post DB here, and we instead changed this to post model and added this line in right underneath the database. Now, if you have those changes, what should happen, we go back to our website, we go to the post editor, we type something in, and when we hit that post button, it doesn't look like anything happened. But if we switch back over to our backend terminal, we can see, whoa, what's going on here? Insert into posts, and it's got all these different fields in there. Well, if it's a SQL import, what's happening? I go to my beekeeper, I double click on my post table and look what I've got in my database. I've got what I typed in on the front end showing up in the database. So your ultimate goal here is if you go to your website, you go to the post editor, you type something in all three fields and you hit the post button that should in your beekeeper show up in the post table as long as you have refreshed the table last time we did this project in cohort three imports in the back end were so new that we still used requires and that's what just tripped me up was that I was I wasn't exporting out the right post and that's why we we got tripped up on create does not exist or create is not a function or whatever bull crap it sends our way Jordan what's up mm -hmm. mine for the longest has said app crashed and uh that the port is already taken Okay, so I think you're having issues because you're op opening multiple terminals, and that's why you're getting um, app crash. But go ahead and share your screen. Um, okay, so you've got, it's not a port taken, it's that DB does not provide an export named P. So that is telling you that is a problem in your server JS. You imported P. You need to import host. You're muted. I hate Zoom. Um, <laughs> all right, my bad. I must have been typing in the middle of that and then pressed down or something. Yeah, so just you just want to read your errors. Um, even though you're getting an app crash, it will almost always tell you why it's crashing. In this okay. case, it was literally pointing right to the point where it was saying, uh -huh. Hey, backend server three, you've got some P in there. I don't understand what that is. Okay, and then let me try running it just to make sure yep raise your hand if you have problems i don't know what's going on 
other than you being muted. Thank you. Um, I inputted some info on um, on the blog, but it doesn't show up on my beekeeper and it also doesn't show up on... Um, it the... won't show up on the homepage yet, but it should be shown up in beekeeper. So share your screen. Let's take a look. So, um, and you've hit the refresh in the bottom right. Yeah, hold on. Let me share okay. the other screen so I can show my code. I did. I hit every single refresh button just for... <laughs> Never enough refresh buttons for BP. Never enough. Now I have to go listen to Greatest Showman. Okay. Um, so let me take a look. Uh, you've got your posts. You've got your posts. You are missing your server.use express.json mm. because we are telling it we're sending in JSON here, but we've got to tell it to parse that JSON in the server before mm. we use it in the rec.body. Okay. So if we switch back to here, well, can, I'll let you do it. I can try it. Oh my God. Where did it go? Oh, it's stuck between two monitors. There you go. Jeez. Okay. I don't know what just happened. So do if I refresh it, then what? So let me, I'll take back over. If you go post editor and just type in uh, one, two, three. Okay, it's not showing up here yet, but that's okay. Where I want to see it is in your beekeeper. Which is over here. <laughs> and if you hit the 40 gazillion refresh buttons, I think it's the one in the bottom right this time. It should show up. No. Okay. Um, I can just drag it and show you that even if I hit here under posts, no, I hit refresh here nothing refresh here nothing okay let me look at your front end that's the only thing i haven't looked at uh who you hosted i don't know who am i hosting i think you mean to be posted instead of hosted don't you oh, probably if that works <laughs> You be posting. Thank you. No problem. Artrell, what's up? All right. So say like three minutes ago, I finally got my uh, my local host 3000 up and running. Okay. Got some errors. I figured out where it was. I had an await, but I didn't have the async mm -hmm. in the um, post editor. I figured that out. So I put that in. So now my 3000 up on the main page, it says everything is awesome home, right? I yep. go to post editor, I input text, I hit post. It takes me back to 3000 regular page, but the post isn't there. The post is not going to be on our homepage yet because think about what operations we've done in the database. Out of our CRUD, we did our create, but we haven't done our read yet or okay. our update or our delete. So what we're checking to see if the create is working is over in Beekeeper. If you can see what you typed in on the post editor showing up in your Beekeeper, we're testing just that little piece of code, right? This is called unit testing. We're testing to make sure that the create is working, not necessarily the full integration testing where we're testing the create, read, update, and delete. All right. So my stupid question is, all right, I'm on beekeeper. Where do I look? Do I go to posts? You double click on posts okay. and that should open a new table. Is your information in there? It says no data. Then your information is not in there and we've got a bug. So go ahead and have <laughs> killing me. I can't share your screen. Should um, I hit refresh anywhere on beekeeper? You can refresh in the bottom right, but whenever you open the table for the first time, it automatically refreshes it. All right, so I did that. I'm gonna double click on post again. Yeah, it just says no data. So check your backend code. 
to make sure that you've got on it's my line seven server dot use express dot json i'm in am i in the server dot js yes all right server dot use parenthesis express dot json set of parentheses close parentheses semicolon and you've got on 14 ish post dot create rec dot body post create rec dot body yes and your endpoint is uh slash post right above it yep yes yeah, slash post comma async rec yes so i would check your front end and make sure that you've got everything in your request lined up with mine okay um in which folder post editor still um, in post editor, yes, it's line 31 ish for me. All right, const response equals await fetch localhost 3001 post method post headers content type application JSON. Seems like that is, I'm, I'm reading it out loud, what I have. Yep, yep. Um, Last thing I would do pop open your console in the browser. For okay, for three thousand, the post yep. editor side. Yep. All right. Do you it's have any of... error messages in there? Console. Um, no, not on the console side. Under the the page where I can input text. No, nothing there. Don't know what to tell you without being able to share your screen. Um, check to see if a Zoom update is available for you. And if it is, install that. If not, I can help you at Open Hack tomorrow, if you can make it. Yeah, I plan on being there tomorrow. Cool. Then I'll help you then. All right. Thank you. Schneider, what's up? Uh, I think it's in my front end. Um, it's telling me on the console that my post connection got refused. It refused to fetch. That is usually because your backend server is not running, and that's usually because it crashed for some reason. Oh, it did crash. <laughs> okay, let me see if I can get that. Thank you. Yep. Remember, it's not the fact that it crashed that's helpful. It's why it crashed that's helpful. And if you scroll up, it should give you the error for that. Uh, maybe I messed up um, redoing auto post stuff. You want to share your screen? We can work through it. Okay. Okay, so you've got it post in all caps. It should be post in lowercase uh, on 21. Nope, in your back end. Oh, well, there too. That should be post in lower. And then 21, that post should be lowercase. And except for the capital P at the beginning, that's because it's got to line up with line five. So five and 21 line up. So now let's go to your server.js. And on three, it should be post with just a capital P. and save and now you've got a problem that you've got two terminal windows open you've got node going on here and node going on over there so go ahead and delete one of them and then click in control c to stop and up enter to restart server.js yeah you got it and you're back in business and everything looks good there
and you're good to go. Cool. Good work. Thank you. Makes you appreciate all the web apps you've used, doesn't it? It was the spelling. So much, so many postings and stuff. It doesn't help that we are posting a post using a post method to a post endpoint to a post in the database. Post was probably not the best choice of word there. Article may have been a better, better word. All right, we are going to stop here tonight. If you can see your post content in Beekeeper, you have crossed the victory line, the finish line for tonight. That is our C done. We still have our R, U, and D of our CRUD to do. So if you're wondering, hey, why is it showing in Beekeeper and not showing on my homepage? We did the create. We didn't do the read yet. And so we will start with the read on Monday. And then we will get our update and our delete working. And then we will progress into authentication using the backend and password uh, authentication, as well as something called sessions in Express. And if you are all good, you shall get to cookie, only because that's where we store our authentication information. You don't actually get a edible cookie, sorry. Hey, did you go over the object relational thingy? It completely slipped my mind. Of what, like what, what an ORM is doing. Mm -hmm. Let me see. I seem to remember having a good YouTube video of like what a what an ORM is, and I couldn't find it in the outline, and it was driving me crazy. Um... Um, I will share this in the live stream channel. I would encourage you to watch it because that's going to be more thorough than I can explain it. And then if you still have questions, Schneider, bring them to Monday's class or just shout out, I need ORM help at OpenHack tomorrow. And I promise you, you will find at least two or three developers who can help. Hey, Max. Um, I wasn't on the Monday and Tuesday, I mean, on Tuesday class, and you went over homework then. What is homework supposed to be? Haven't, haven't posted the homework yet, but the homework will be um, to make the delete button work in our chat app based off of some comments we left at the end of class yesterday. So we kind of did pseudocode of how to make the delete button work. Your homework will be actually getting that, doing those, I think it was eight steps. Um, and those are documented in the live stream channel. It says like homework number as inline comments, and that will kind of help you finish that assignment. Uh, but I'll get that posted up to um, to Zoom or to Canvas. So is that supposed to be like homework number one is like the first step and then second yes. step and third step? Okay. You got it. Yeah. All to complete that one assignment of the delete button should work. Um, but if you model it off of how we made the edit button work, it will be much easier to follow the steps that we put in line. I unfortunately do not have any time slots available um, this Sunday. Um, I'm guessing... Uh, Office hours are right in the middle of the Super Bowl, aren't they? Um, I don't know if that matters for anyone. Would we prefer to do Friday office hours instead of Sunday office hours? Getting a bunch of it doesn't really matter or I don't really attend anyways or... Max, I'm only these off for Sundays and Tuesdays. I'm in PR, so it's, I won't be watching the football game. <laughs> it's almost the U.S. It, it pretty much counts. Uh, I like watching it, but I, I'm, I'm going to have a lot of other stuff to do. So, <laughs> Totally fair. Um, let me see what my calendar looks like. Um... Uh, 
uh, I'm going to move office hours to 5.30 on Friday. Is that helpful for anyone or should I just go ahead and cancel it? Eh, doesn't matter to me. All right, I can't getting... attend, but that's fine. I'm still at work at 5 30. All right, let I me go ahead. The video, so can um... we do it a little early on Sunday? Like maybe 4 3 30, so that it's still on Sunday, but it's earlier. Yeah, I can probably do that. Um... If that works better for everyone else. Uh, oh, that the works. game doesn't start until 6.30, so I guess 5 isn't conflicting with anyone else. So I'll just leave it Sunday at 5. Okay. All right, that's all I got. I will stick around and help anyone debug who needs it, but you can fill out your form on your web page, hit the post button, go over to Beekeeper, hit the refresh button and see your data. You are all caught up. And you are now officially full stack developers. Think about this. This is your second full stack project where you are getting some data in the front end, passing it through the back end, and making it show up in your database. So we'll finish out the rest of those operations, the read, the update, and the delete. Make sure that those posts are showing up on the home page and talk about how we can integrate routing into our database not to mention the fun of authentication, login, and password encryption. That's all coming your way next week and a tiny little bit of the following week because we are off not next Monday, but the following Monday. Tuesday, that Tuesday is your last class with me until the final week of the cohort. Nathan comes back in for a week and a half and then you get Laura with the career module and then we finish it all up with the final capstone week push. We're getting Capstone close, check guys. In. Capstone check-in is scheduled for a day that's on the spreadsheet. Uh, Capstone check-in is... February 21, I guess. Yes. February 21st is my last day with you guys before the final week. And I'll be around when Nathan is teaching and most of when Laura is teaching as well. So don't think I go away for one-on-ones when I'm not teaching, I'll still be available. And mostly can help with what Nathan is teaching. He's using a new deploy method that I'm not entirely familiar with, but I will probably be able to help. That's all I got for you guys. Like I said, I'll hang around in case anyone stuck anywhere. Otherwise, have a great evening. I will hopefully see you at uh, Open Hack tomorrow. Um, I don't know if you guys know or if if you said this yesterday, Max, but um, the questionnaires are on Slack that I posted for uh, for interviews. Please take a read of that. It's very very helpful. Okay. Thank you so much for sharing those. Those those look great. No problem. Yeah, and I think you all get jobs after this. And yeah. even if you um even if you get asked a question that is not on that list, chances are there is a question that is on that list that if you are prepared for, it will help you answer the version of the question that they are asking. So it may not be exactly worded, but if you've got a rehearsed answer for every question on that list chances are if they do throw a curveball at you, you'll be much better prepared to answer that. Or you'll get to the level that I'm at where you can bullshit about anything and then interviews become fun on an entirely different level. Archer, what's going on? All right, so I'm still I'm still debugging. I realize I forgot to stringify in a certain section, so I'll put it there. And now when I go to the website, um, I get an error in the bottom of the console. It's like post, HTTP localhost doesn't post, 404 not found. Okay, so 404 not found, check your front end to make sure that your method is set to post, which is right here. 
All right. And you're in um, post Post editor in the front end. All right. So my method, which is around 32. Yeah, it's set to post. Okay. Your URL is set to 3001 slash post. Yep. Let me just make sure that is a an O and not an A. I'm going to delete it and put an O back in there. Command S. Okay. Yeah, I'm not okay. getting any words in the bottom. Now in your back end on server.js around 13, you should have a server.post mm -hmm. and then a quote and a slash and the word post, and they should both be singular. No, mine looks a little weird. Uh, hold on, server.js, server.post. Okay. No, hold on. I think that's why I was having the issue. Let me put... Dot post, uh, comma, is that post, comma, async, rec, res. And then I got to close it out. Okay, after the curly brace. All right, let's see if that makes a difference, Max. A. Post. All right, now my terminal, I saw it update on the back Daddy. end. All right, so now I'm going to double click on Beekeeper. Doesn't show anything there, but it does show in my terminal. But then it says it crashed, waiting for file changes before starting. All right, what's the crash? Uh, no JS version, whatever. Node mon app crash waiting for a file changes before starting. But what right about above that, yeah. Um, it showed like a bunch of parameters and a lot scroll of scroll up until you find something that looks human readable. <laughs> Hold on, this is gonna take a second. <laughs> Error at query run. Bunch of stuff named sequelizer. Uh, it looks like the error is just a query run. Query JS5025 sequelized. Looks like somewhere in the sequelized. And then a Keep whole going bunch. up though. There should be something in there about why the query failed. A okay, server running 3001, execute default, executing default, executing default. Because the error is in white, but before that, it looks like everything was going well. Executing default, select, real name, as name, such and such value. Then the error is stuff in white, and then it shows stuff in green, name, SQLize database error. Uh, it's really hard without being able to see your screen. Trust me, I believe it. And then <laughs> index, then it's like length 252, severity, error, code 23502, detail, failing row contains null, comma, A, comma, C, like stuff I was typing in. Hint position, internal. Um, oh. In your, in your post.js in the back end. Do you have title, tagline, and content as all lowercase? Title, lowercase, tagline, lowercase, content, lowercase, yes. Um, don't know what to tell you without being able to, to see it. Um, I'm wondering if the problem, Schneider said, just screenshot it and post it. I'm wondering if the problem is something in Beekeeper, not in your code itself. Um, but without being able to screen share, it's really hard to uh, really hard to debug it. I would say update your Zoom and jump back in the meeting and see if that fixes your screen share issue. Okay. Because Schneider has a question anyway, and I'll 
I'll be here. I'll hang out for a minute. The Zoom uh, update only takes a minute or two. All right, I'll do that. Two Senator, questions. Going on. Yeah. Um, uh, do I have to worry about, uh, is there a safe way to exit out Postgres without my uh, databases being corrupted or can I just press X and call it a day? You can just hit X on that. I mean, there okay. there is if you're running it like on a production server, um, but if you just quit out of the Postgres app or go into the Postgres app and hit the stop button on it, those are both safe ways of doing it. Oh, okay, stop button. And it just saves everything. Okay, yeah. second question. Uh, is it cool if I post some projects we did on my GitHub? And if so, how do I name it? Because it's not my code. It was projects we did in class. So do I like, what's the format? You wrote it, you followed along with it. As far as I'm concerned, it's your code. Um, so you can name it whatever you want. Um, in the readme, if you wanted to, you could say project completed as portfolio piece during careers in code cohort four um, and like link to the careers in code website. Um, that's probably not a bad idea just to give the person context who's reviewing the code. Like, hey, they did this while they were in a boot camp. This is beginner kind of level code. Um, but copyright or permission wise, you're, you're free to go to, to post it. You wrote it. You followed along with me. To me, that's that's code that you wrote. Yeah, there's only like, I don't know, two or three projects that went in and did extra stuff where I can feel like it's my code. But other than that, yeah, I followed along with everything else. Thank you. Yeah, that's fine. Hey, hey, trust me, I'm not making these projects for the sake of making billions off of it, right? These are all, I just happen to, that's the way I teach, right? Is very much hands-on. Um, and there's just no other way that I know how to convey these concepts. So um, that's why I do it that way. Looking forward to posting my caps on though. That's going to be yes, great. For sure. All right. Drum roll, please. Oh, you're on mute. I did have to update it. So I did update it. So let's see if that works. Uh, no, you hit record, not uh, share. How do I stop recording? <laughs> uh, down at the bottom, you should have a pause and a stop button. You can hit stop down there. No, I don't see that. Oh, I see a record button. It doesn't say. Oh.